Hello and good afternoon. Today I'm going to be discussing the differences between Ashkenazic and Sephardic Judaism. What is the difference between Ashkenazic and Sephardic Judaism? To a large degree, it is location, location, location. In a nutshell, Ashkenazic Jews and their descendants come from France, Germany, and Eastern Europe. Sephardic Jews and their descendants come from Spain, Portugal, North Africa, and parts of the Middle East. But to fully understand the distinctions of these two subcultures within Judaism, there is much more to learn about the places from which they came and the traditions that started there. Let's begin with what is likely the more familiar of the two. The adjective Ashkenazic and corresponding nouns Ashkenazi, which is singular, and Ashkenazim, the plural, are derived from the Hebrew word Ashkenaz, which refers to Germany. The name Ashkenaz appears in the Torah, in the book of Genesis in chapter 10, and there it is a name used for one of the grandchildren of Japhet, a son of Noah, and this is a progenitor of one of the nations formed after the flood. The Talmud identifies Ashkenaz's father as Gomer, or Germania. It is not clear if this is at all related to our modern day Germany, but it might be the basis for a biblical association with the Germany of old. Why Germany? A small number of Jews are believed to have settled there in Western Germany and in Northern France in the 9th to 10th centuries, especially along the Rhine River. Their population grew and generally started to migrate towards the east, especially to Poland, till about the 12th century when Jewish communities were established as far away from Germany as Russia. Often the migrations were forced upon them by oppression and pogroms. This was after all the era of the Crusades and blood libels and by rulers who expelled them or deprived them of economic opportunities. This forced the Jews to continue to move on, to continue to search for more hospitable lands. By the mid 14th century, however, due to repeated massacres and expulsions in the East, Jews had moved from Germany to the East and then began to move back again. By the 18th century and beyond, Jews were mostly migrating back towards the West and even towards America because of the much harsher conditions that were now in Eastern Europe. Thus, eventually most European Jews became known as Ashkenazim, regardless of their actual country of origin. Today, about 80% of Jews are Ashkenazic. This percentage, of course, was much higher before the Holocaust. And many of us here in America are Ashkenazic too, descending from Jews who emigrated from Germany and Eastern Europe from the mid 1800s through the early 1900s and beyond. Hmm, so what if our ancestors or what if your ancestors did not come from Germany or Eastern Europe? You may very well be a Sephardic Jew. The adjective Sephardic and corresponding noun Sephardi, which is singular, and Sephardim, plural, are derived also from a Hebrew word, the Hebrew word Sepharad, which usually refers to Spain. Sepharad is biblical, but it marks a biblical place of uncertain location. It is found in the book of Obadiah, a minor prophet thought to have lived and written around the 6th century BCE. The term Sephardic Jews usually means Spanish Jews, but just like its counterpart Ashkenazic, it has been broadened widely. Today, it is almost universally, and I might add mostly inaccurately, applied to all non-Ashkenazic Jews. That history is interesting too. Jews have lived throughout the main lands associated with Sephardic Jewry, Spain, North Africa, and parts of the Middle East since antiquity. 
Spain became an especially prosperous and tolerant land from the 8th century on under Muslim rule, and Jewish communities flourished there, both economically and religiously, in this golden age. These were the original Sephardic Jews. In later centuries, roughly around the 12th century, conditions in Spain became much more oppressive, both under the Muslims and later the Christians. The Jews were eventually expelled or forced to convert. From Spain in 1492, they were forced to leave there and from neighboring Portugal in 1497. They spread from there to many existing areas of Jewish habitation, places where Jewish communities were thriving, North Africa and throughout the Ottoman Empire. Often they superimposed their own religious rulings and customs on the local populations. And many of these lands became more associated, more closely associated with Sephardic tradition in spite of the vast difference in custom and culture. A little known fact is that most of the early Jewish settlers here in America were Sephardic. The first Jewish congregation in North America, Sharath Israel, founded in what is now New York in 1684, was of the Sephardic tradition, and it still continues to be so. Philadelphia's first Jewish congregation, Congregation Mikvah Israel, founded in 1740, was also a Sephardic congregation, and it too still functions as such. With this brief historical overview, it is easy to tell that there are differences between us, between the Ashkenazim and the Sephardim. And there are also differences in the way that these communities did or did not integrate into the larger community. In the Christian lands where Ashkenazic Judaism flourished, the tension between Christians and Jews was so great that Jews tended to be isolated, either voluntarily or involuntarily from their non-Jewish neighbors. In the Islamic lands where Sephardic Judaism developed and thrived, there was less segregation and oppression and more integration into the non-Jewish culture. Sephardic Jewish and thought was thus strongly influenced by Arabic and Greek philosophy and science. This, it goes without saying, created two very different Jewish experiences. There are many minor differences between them in Jewish law and custom as a result. Some of this is because of the rabbis who wrote and led. Two of the greatest medieval rabbis, Rabbi Yitzchak Alfazi of Fez, Morocco, and Maimonides, a known name to many of us, who eventually settled in Egypt, became some of the main authorities for the law among the Sephardim. Centuries later, a work called Shulchan Aruch, written by Rabbi Joseph Caro in 1564, solidified these rulings as his work became the basis for Sephardic Jewish law. In Northern Europe, at the same time, there were other great rabbis, rabbinic authorities located primarily in Germany and France. Perhaps the most well-known one of these is Rashi, a commentator who lived in the 12th century. He and a colleague, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, or that is him, he, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki Rashi and his colleagues formed what became the basis for Ashkenazi law. But they too relied heavily upon Shulchan Aruch by Joseph Karo. And so it is that these works and these essays that were given to us, both as Ashkenazim and Sephardim, converged and diverged. Each drew upon Shulchan Aruch but put its own flavor upon it, thus maintaining its differences. As a result, both Ashkenazi and Sephardi Judaism thrived together and separately. And there is much that is similar in the way we are as Jews, but there is much that continues to be different too. For instance, Ashkenazic pronunciation of Hebrew is somewhat distinct from the Sephardic way of speaking. Ashkenazic Hebrew pronounces a few vowels 
and one Hebrew consonant differently. Think Shabbos, which is Ashkenazic, and Shabbat, which is Sephardic. Same thing, different tradition. However, most Ashkenazim have adopted the Sephardic pronunciation because it is the one that is used in modern Hebrew and in Israel. There is also a lot of dispute about how to observe the laws of Passover. Ashkenazim have typically followed the custom not to eat rice, legumes, and the like. Will Sephardim do? But that too is changing. In recent years, rice and another grain, quinoa, have made it into the list of acceptable things to eat during Passover. Ashkenazim do not name their children after living relatives. Well, Sephardim do, and their children often do have the same names as living grandparents. Most Ashkenazic Jews do not wear a tallit, a prayer shawl, until after becoming bar or bat mitzvah, while Sephardim wear them at much younger ages. There are also differing opinions on the laws of kashrut, Ashkenazim view fish as parv, meaning it can be consumed with meat or milk. Many Sephardim have the custom of not eating fish and milk together. Sephardic Judaism does not have denominations. Although some individual Sephardic Jews are less observant than others, and some individuals do not agree with all the beliefs of traditional Judaism, there is no formal organized differentiation into movements like there is in Ashkenazic Judaism. These are but a few examples of the differences. There are many more that we can explore in future segments. It's fun to figure out where our traditions come from, where we belong. Are you Ashkenazic, Sephardic, a combination of the two? Or perhaps you identify with a different subculture within Judaism. There are others to explore, and we will do that sometime soon. <laughs>